Ara was a normal college student. She had no friends, but one of the other students paid attention to her. It was the most beautiful girl on campus, Inna. The main character lost out to her because of her appearance. Inna has a friend, Sora, who tells her that Ara is a psychopath. She heard this from her sister, who was in contact with the protagonist's cousin. It was undeniable, but there was a nuance. Ara's aunt beat her often, and it was she who sent the girl to a psychiatric hospital by force. After Sora's words, Inna began to avoid any contact with Ara. When she heard the phone ringing, she noticed that it was her aunt calling. She knew what the conversation would be about. Ara takes courage and refuses to answer the call. The heroine's parents were killed in a car accident when she was five years old. Her aunt volunteered to raise her, but she was only good when Ara's father was around. The aunt comes to the college and tries to get the girl to talk. Ara doesn't want to submit to her again, to be her slave, so she runs away as fast as she can. But due to her inattention, she does not notice the car that hits her. When the girl regains consciousness, she finds herself next to a strange woman. She keeps repeating how much she loves Ara. Together they fall asleep in an embrace. In one of the houses, the children could not sleep even though it was late. The king of demons burst into the house out of nowhere, but he did not come with evil intentions. The king could not control his emotions and went to the castle. There he was told that his wife's sign was dead. He saw the lifeless body of his beloved, but in the end, she asked the king to take care of her daughter. Lord Caravan is taking lessons in childcare from an ordinary family, but he is not very good at it. He probably needs more practice. Ara realizes that she has been reborn. She still remembers the events that happened to her just before she died, but now it is in the past. A new life awaits her. The girl did not understand who this handsome man was who took care of her, but she felt safe with him, as if no one could hurt her like they had before. No matter how strange the situation, children's instincts cannot be overcome. Several people took care of the girl, but they did not do a good job. Nobody could understand what she wanted, but one of them was responsible for the girl. This is a young man with blue hair, Raphael. He had been Sign's life path, and now after her death, he was obliged to take care of the child for the rest of her life. The master was still practicing childcare and ordered his subject to write down the correct positions of his hands. The nanny he asked for help wrote down why he was doing this when he had maids like her, but when he got no answer, he gave her the reward for her work. The caravan came to visit their daughter. Her name was Irene. She was the daughter of the demon king and the holy knight, beloved by the gods. Whoever dares to harm her will immediately feel the wrath of the gods. The king takes the girl to the room of the beings for the first time, where she learns that they are her parents. Irene has incredible bright green eyes like her mother's. One hundred days have passed since the girl's birth. During this time, Raphael promised to be Irene's godmother. He really took care of her like a mother. Suddenly, a man entered the room through the window. Irene did not understand who he was. It turned out that he could read minds. The man introduced himself as her grandfather. Using his ability, he answered some of the child's questions. The grandfather sent his granddaughter to a place unknown to her, and there she met her mother. She was happy to see her for the first time after realizing what had happened to her. Irene promises her mother that she will be strong for her, her father, and the others. Two years have passed since the girl's birth. On her birthday, a video of the celebration was recorded, but it was spoiled by fights between Raphael and Hargan, the king's assistant. This jealousy of Irene continued even now. Even the girl realized this and tried to improve their relationship. While looking through the letters, Caravan notices one that says there is a conspirator who wants to kill him. He has to make an accurate decision. This is not the first time that an attempt has been made on the king's life. It happened many years ago, and he easily managed to eliminate the attackers. But this time, he remembers what one of them said, that the next time, he would not only lose himself, but also everything that was important to him. When the king went to hell on business, he ordered Hargain and Raphael to take care of the girl. Rin was upset because this was not the first time this had happened. She knew her father was trying to do his best for her, but in his absence, memories of her past life came flooding back. Before going to bed, Raphael read a book about fairies to Irene, and unexpectedly, the girl asked him if she could make friends. Raphael thought it was strange, because a child of three does not think about such things. The next day, Rin and Harjan went on a picnic to keep her from being sad. Of course, this happened after a small fight between the godparents. After a while, they came to a huge field of flowers. The girl played and had a lot of fun, but when she saw a white flower, she thought of her father and the bracelet she had made for him. Sadness came over Irene's face. Har and Rail flew over to her. They were afraid that the girl had been hurt, but it was a different kind of pain, spiritual pain. The godparents realized this and advised her not to keep it to herself, for they would always be by her side. But someone was watching her from the bushes. Harjan immediately ran after the person. 
it was an unknown boy. He introduced himself as Rega. He had come to visit his aunt who lived nearby. He was not happy to see an Asmodian and an Illyrian like Har and Rail, but he was interested in the picture of the little girl. She approached him with a frown on her face and told him to apologize for the hurtful things he had said about her godparents. This made Irene cry. After this situation, the girl was hungry. Raphael kindly opened the bag of food and Rin started to eat. She noticed Rega's look and handed him a sandwich. He was surprised by this action of the Asmodian's daughter. When they finished eating, the boy continued to ask the girl questions. He could not understand who she was. Eventually, Irene learned that the boy was 495 years old. Surprised, she lied about her age and said she was 550. Rega was also shocked by this answer, but it was clear from his face that he liked the girl. Not wanting to leave Rin, he insisted on going to the castle with her. But there, Rega would not allow anyone to touch the girl because he was jealous. At the castle, Har and Rael tried to explain to the others what the dragon was doing with Irene. It seems that the girl has finally found a friend of her own age. A month had passed since Rin's father had left on business. She was sad and hadn't heard from him, but she had her friend Rega to cheer her up. In the evening of that day, Har told Irene that Rega would no longer come to visit. There was a big age difference, so he talked to his parents about it, and they came to a decision. She knew that, but Rega was her only friend. It seemed as if she had just managed to make friends, but now Rin was lonely again. This time she dreamed about her parents. They were having fun while driving somewhere in a car, but a bus pulled up to meet them. These were the events of the fateful day when her parents died. She saw the car catch fire and a man come out of the flames. At first she asked him if he had seen her parents, but later she realized that the man was Lord Caravan. When she recognized him, she jumped into his arms. Irene was very happy to see her father. When she woke up, she began to remember everything that had happened to her. Just the thought of Rag made her cry. But suddenly the king entered her room and it was definitely not a dream. In hell, Caravan and his assistants were cleaning up. After completing all necessary tasks, he returned to the castle with the news. After telling Hargan, the Lord tells him to take the news to the king of the West. The mysterious he is behind it all. In the afternoon, Irene and her father went to the same flower field where she first met Rag, but there was no time to be sad, so they grabbed the Lord's hand and ran across the field. Suddenly, someone in the middle of the field shouted in denial that there was only one fairy princess. Caravan got up and grabbed the fairy and held her in his arms. Rin was surprised to see the fairy. She wanted to take her home in an insect jar. The princess was outraged by the situation and demanded that she be released immediately or war would be inevitable. But when she saw the delicious cakes Rail had placed in the jar, she decided to stay with them. Already in the castle, during the conversation between Princess Riel, Raphael, and Irene, the fairy is not afraid to speak out, which offends the little girl. She is struck by the words about loneliness among other adults. But this conversation is interrupted by a noise outside. Rega could be seen in the sky, but he did not come alone. He came with the elder of the Red Dragon Clan. He wanted to talk to the Demon King of the Southern Lands. During the conversation, Caravan cannot contain his emotions caused by the slander against his daughter, and the parents get into a fight. To resolve the situation, they decide to discuss it in the castle. Ray tells the truth, and the parents come to the conclusion that the children can safely communicate again. The area where the king and the others live belongs to Taisha, the elder's sister, so it would be okay for Ray to come and spend time with Rin. Caravan remembers the first moments of his life, how he saw his father, his words, and how he saw the sword the elder left him. He did not understand what awaited him in this world. He received the title of Demon King of the Southern Lands after defeating the previous king in hell. After that, Caravan became stronger and eventually was recognized by other kings. On the orders of the evil spirit, he went to the underworld to find the Asmodians and punish them, but someone else had already done so. It was St. Nyrus. Upon seeing her, something strange happens to Caravan's body. He feels hot, his face turns red. He's not familiar with this feeling. After this incident, the rumors about the connection between Sign and the king reached the top of hell. But so far, no one has done anything about it. Arriving at the northern king's castle, he gives the key to the caravan. He has to meet with Sign. He's afraid that he will not be able to find her if the girl answers him. Overwhelmed with joy, he wastes no time in embracing her. After a warm greeting, she and Raphael return to the Nyrus family residence. Rael does not like the caravan because of their behavior. In the evening, the king thought about leaving Sine. He wanted to spend time with her. So when she came up to him, he took the chance. But she was not ready for him, so she pushed Caravan away and went to her room. But San knew this would happen sooner or later. She was afraid of her future, that it would be shrouded in darkness. 
But she was able to make a decision, and then they promised each other that they would be together no matter what. After the wedding, Sin became pregnant with their child. She was happy. But on the day of the birth, her life was gone. Carr was angry, but looking into his daughter's eyes, he promised that he would love and protect this child. Looking at Rin now, he was ready to do anything for her happiness. Today is Irene's seventh birthday. When she comes down from her room into the hall, she notices that no one is there. The girl reads a letter in which Raphael wrote that he was urgently called to work. Time has passed and her friends have not come. She decides to go to the garden where Lily lives alone, leaving a letter. At that time, Rago was taking care of his younger siblings. He wanted to leave here as soon as possible to look for Irene. His thoughts were only of her, but he could not leave her unattended. While walking, Rin realizes that she is lost. She encounters a pack of monsters that the brave knight has successfully defeated. But instead of letting the girl go, they want to take her with them until she tells them where she came from. The king was choosing gifts for Rin's birthday and did not notice how quickly the time passed. But at some point, the bracelet responsible for Irene's magic barrier broke. The king and Harjan must hurry back to the castle. Everyone was ordered to search for Rin. The caravan searched for her using magic and the traces of the bracelet. He finds her in the clutches of a monster in the middle of the forest and quickly subdues it, taking Irene with him. The knights are surprised by the man's sudden appearance. Yet Rin, or rather her subconscious, finds herself in an endless dark room. She realizes that this is not the first time she has been reborn in another universe. In each of her previous lives, there was no happy ending and no good memories. Suddenly, a white bird and a black and white door appear. The bird wants her to go through the door. After going through it, she finds herself in a magical flower field with a river nearby. In the reflection is a person unknown to the subconscious, although he resembles Irene. Suddenly, a woman appears and calls her. The stranger tells the girl not to worry about what happened before. Now she is who she's supposed to be. She should only worry about the people around her now. A girl wakes up after being in a coma for four days. At that time, no one could calm down and do anything because it might cause more harm to the child. After she woke up, the others went into hypercare mode again. Everyone tried to help Irene so that she would not hurt herself. Hargan taught the girl defense magic, but it was boring. Her mind was full of memories of meeting the knights, the first humans in this universe. Realizing that Rin was not interested in listening to theory, Hargan decided to show her how to use fire mana. The girl was impressed and wanted to repeat it, but before he could tell her anything about it, Irene got it. It was a miracle, because it always took practice. When the lesson was over, Lily looked out of the picture. She was not at all surprised by Rin's ability, which made her angry, but it was short-lived until the fairy remembered her old friend, Irene. Irene is the name of the girl Irene used to communicate with in her subconscious. The little girl asked the fairy to tell her everything she knew about her. Irene was a holy knight and an immortal. She was ordered to destroy the Wyrians, but she violated the world order, and now her name shall not be spoken. The grandfather overhears this conversation and speaks to the girl's subconscious. He says that Irene's punishment is not over. The evil spirit knows that it is in his granddaughter's body. Finally, the grandfather asks Rin not to tell anyone about this conversation and uses his spell. The king prepares a meal for his daughter, but all he sees in the room is her in her father's arms. The evil spirit warned him about the actions of the eastern king and ordered him to return to hell in a year to deal with it and to take Rin with him because it was dangerous to be here. The girl herself went back to the subconscious. She wanted to ask Irene a question, but she only gave her her bird. Now Irene has a part of her. Once again, Rin failed in her practice of using fire mana. She did not understand why. Maybe it was because Irene had disappeared. It was getting late, so Ray's parents came to pick him up. Irene had never seen them before, but she was most surprised by the boy's aunt's use of magic. She wondered if she would ever be able to match her. At night, the child had a dream in which little Irene was with her teacher. She could not learn to control her mana. There was still a lot of practice ahead of her, but only she could understand how to control her powers. Irene remembered how Irene had been able to see the image of her mana. If she tried, she could see her own pure mana. In the morning, Hargan tells the girl about her peculiarity. Normally, in creatures like her, magical blood absorbs human blood, but Irene's blood is in perfect balance. Together with her friends, she went to visit Rega. Because of a mention of Irene Lily, the boy's aunt, Taisha, loses control of herself. She remembers her son who died because of his interest in the human world. Because of this loss, Taisha begins to destroy everything around her. Neighboring races and her family were damaged, but only Irene was able to bring her to her senses. By the time the woman was ready to thank her, Irene was gone. After some time, Irene had to return home. Before she did, Taisha gave her a magic ring. 
It was responsible for teleportation, protection, and healing magic, and was made for being. The caravan tells Raphael that they are taking Rin to hell with them. This outrages the angel, so he tells him to get the idea out of his head and that he can't help. Rael goes to the archangel for advice on the situation. He cannot help him, but advises him to give Irene the sword of her mother, Sane. The archangel does so at the request of the evil spirit and gives the sword to maintain the balance of the child's blood in hell. The king and his daughter went to Payan. There they went to eat Malin's sweets and were noticed by the locals. But the reason for all this was a conversation with Rin about her future. Lily suddenly disappears. It scared the girl very much. The fairy must be found. Irene gets lost in a crowd, but finds Lily. But there was a problem. She had lost the whistle her father had given her. It must be used if the girl is in danger. She decides to use magic, but the robbers are faster than her. They quickly put Rin in chains and were satisfied with the result. But someone interrupted them and saved Irene. The man introduced himself as Ryan. He was handsome like a prince. When he talked to the girl, he recognized her as Irene. It turns out that Irene has sprained her ankle, so Ryan offers to go to his house and help her. He is a knight of the Turkish swordsman clan. They had previously made a promise to one of the kings, but failed to keep it. Suddenly, Ryan makes a Tai Ching oath that if Irene agrees, he'll protect her for the rest of his life. But if she refuses, he will die. The girl sees Irene's memory of Ryan. After that, Rin decides to take the oath. A month had passed since Ryan joined the girl's company. She has received a letter inviting her to Rega's dragon coming-of-age ceremony. She wonders if she should attend. When they arrived at the sacred land of the dragons for the ceremony, they were met by the elder and head of the clan Kello. He immediately recognized the girl as Irene and noticed Ryan. Rin was surprised by the change in Ryan's appearance, but he was still the same old boy. At the ceremony, a fight broke out between another dragon and the boy's group. He was surprised by the friendship between the dragon and the demon, as these races had always been enemies. But Rin still had the blood of the Holy Knight in him. Carr was angry when his daughter cried because of this. He wanted to attack the dragon, but Taisha stopped him. This could not be allowed, for war would have been inevitable. Rega's coming-of-age ceremony ends, and a young man walks out into the crowd. He was unrecognizable. Irene joked that they should call him uncle from now on. Afterwards, Kello took Rin away for a talk between them. He had to check something. He asked her to pick up a stone with her mana, which she did. Now Kello was sure he was looking at Irene. During the conversation, Irene told the dragon head about her past life and expressed her thoughts about her present life. She was very worried about it, but she was afraid to tell anyone. Rin told him about the dreams she had with Irene and her grandfather. She said that her future would most likely not be happy. Finally, Kallo asked her not to let Ryan spend too much time with her. He is much more dangerous than he appears. So everyone left the sacred land. Irene tells Ray that she is going to hell with the king after her birthday. The boy is outraged and tries to prove to the others that this cannot be allowed. But he only succeeds in causing a quarrel. When Rin opened her eighth birthday presents, Raphael gave her her mother's sword. She didn't know how to use it, but she could stop thinking about it now and just keep it as a bracelet. Raphael and Sane would always be with her. After saying goodbye to everyone, they went to hell. Time passed much slower there. She immediately received attention from her father's helpers. They told her about the sad fate of half-breeds in hell, but the king insisted that she was his daughter and he would not tolerate any mistreatment. Irene could not adjust to the conditions in hell. She had no friends again, and everyone seemed indifferent to her. It was time for her to move into her own room. She did not get along with the maid because they had different ideas about life. But after she finished her work, she and the others left the room. At night, Rin opened Kello's gift, and there was a book. But it was Irene's diary, which turned into manna after reading. This gave Irene the motivation to practice. The king is worried that he hasn't visited Irene for a long time. But there are more important things to do now. He summoned all the other kings, except the eastern king, to discuss a plan to confront him. But the ruler of the western lands felt a strange energy coming from upstairs on the next floor. She burst into the room and saw the knight. But she was even more impressed by the girl. Princess Selina immediately realized that she was a half-breed. Esther was not happy that the king had left hell to have a relationship with a human, so she came to see him. She provoked Caravan's emotions and was able to read his mind. He then beat her. The king still appoints Niang as his daughter's personal maid because of her age. He did this to prevent her from being bored and lonely. At night, he finally came to visit his daughter. By chance, he fell asleep with her. He dreamed that Irene, in her dream, reminded him of how the caravan wanted to kill her at birth and asked him to do it. The day Sane died, he regretted what he had done. It was a big mistake. Meanwhile, something strange happened in the palace of the Eastern King. A servant carried out his orders and delivered the necessary incarnations to the Northern Territories. 
After giving him power, the king ordered him to destroy everything in the southern palace. After destroying the surroundings of the castle, he is soon attacked by the South King. Other kings also come to his aid. This was a clear declaration of war by the East King. Now it was time to attack. The caravan tells Rin that they have to leave her for a while. This was for her protection. The king asked her to be quiet and careful in the palace while he was gone. The preparations for the war are in full swing. The army is almost ready to attack. Suddenly, Harjan and his master are left alone. Their conversation is about how the demons feel about the caravan king. Some of them do not like the joy that appeared on the Lord's face after Irene's appearance. Some, on the other hand, will follow him because of this change in his behavior. Harjan promises to be with the king forever. In the East King's palace, he turns his hostage hash 220 into a monster with a new spell. This hostage was Kata, the brother of the maid Nyan. Irin and the maid go to the palace terrace and share their experiences. Nyang says that after her parents died, she and her brother were taken hostage. But for some unknown reason, she was released, leaving her brother behind bars. The girl feels sorry for her maid's tragic fate. At night, something takes over Nyang's body. It goes to Irene's room, ignoring the rules of the palace. Wanting to kill the girl, the creature disregards Ryan, who always protects Rin. It turns out that the body of the maid is being controlled by the king of the eastern demons. He does this through the connection between his hostage and Niang. To do this, he freed his sister and sent her to the southern king to monitor his actions and get personal information. Nian, now transformed into a true demon, attacks Irene, and Ryan tries to protect her. His magic is not enough, so the princess uses an ice blast on the maid herself. But that doesn't help either, and Rin finds herself in the monster's clutches. Using a magic circle, the demon escapes with Diagro. But Ryan has a special connection to the princess, so he uses his feelings to follow her. Irene must be saved at all costs. Meanwhile, in the eastern territories, the northern king is alone with the caravan. He thinks that the southern king's return to hell with his daughter and this war are somehow connected. Her father is an evil spirit who is hiding something from them, and they must be careful. Irene is possessed by the East King, who threatens her that with one touch he can change all her memories. He orders her to tell Nyan what Caravan said about the day she was born. Now, remembering that her father wanted to kill her at birth because her mother had died, she remembers everything that happened before. These thoughts tell her that she is a failure and worthless. The East King has succeeded in entering her mind. Ryan tells the Caravan that his daughter has been captured. The King immediately goes to the East King's palace. Harjan orders Zalf to gather an army and launch an offensive. The princess must not be harmed. Suho, the eastern king, takes control of Irene's life, but is surprised to find that she has memories from before her birth that he cannot access. Meanwhile, the king of the southern demons breaks into the hall. Meanwhile, Harjan and Ryan have gone to the other kings, Solhel and Selina, for help. They could not agree, but the knight offered to lead them through the traps with him. It seemed like a crazy idea but Ryan had already thought it through. Beneath the walls of the palace of the King of the Eastern Demons, Lord Caravan's army falls into a trap set by Suho. They are attacked by a pack of his monsters. Har and Ryan and the kings arrive to help them. The knight quickly deals with the monsters and asks Solhel if they found the girl. The king says that he cannot sense her aura, but now he is interested in the mysterious identity of the creature that tried to help them. It is a scout for the Eastern King, and it knows where Irene is. At the palace, Suho tries to stage the suicide of the Southern King. He managed to take control of him with the help of personal cloning. But this does not happen as Selina manages to get to her. Unimpressed by the image of the Eastern King, she challenges him to a fight. In the prison, an unknown white lighter emerges from Irene's ring. He begs Nyan to help the princess, freeing her mind from Suho's control. When the girl regains consciousness, she learns that another grandfather, Sain's father, helped her. Talking to him gave the princess determination and courage, and after considering her existence, she will leave the prison. But before she can do anything, Zalf appears. He is glad to find Irene alive, but it was still dangerous there. The monster is killed by an unknown trio, who also appeared in the prison out of nowhere. They are former assistants of the Eastern King and ask the princess for help. According to one of them, Liban, King Suho is now ruled by another person. The scout says that after the appearance of the unknown creature, the eastern king began to behave strangely. He gave the stranger power and ordered him to obey him. The origin of the creature is unknown, but the reason for his visit was the desire to collect black crystals. Attacking Suho, he cannot bear his impending defeat. 
he transforms into a monstrous monster with a distinctive sharp-angled gem mark. Selina says that it seemed to be cursed and banished from all worlds by God himself. Such creatures were to be avoided. They were called imps. Liban helped the princess get out of prison, but he was suddenly attacked by Ryan. He was focused on finding Lord Caravan and Miss Rin. When the knight saw the girl, he immediately retreated and ran to her. Now they were together again. A hellish battle was taking place in the Eastern King's reception room. Because of his newfound strength, Suho could easily resist the attacks of the others, and he was delighted with his newfound power. Having captured Caravan, he calmly took away the sword that the evil spirit had given him at birth. Believing that without it, the Southern King would be unable to do anything, Suho seemed to dissolve it in the air. Not content to be ignored once again, Queen Selina attacks Suho first. After the king easily repulsed this attack, he created his own copy to fight her. This infuriates her, and she is determined to defeat this wretched creature. Seizing the moment, the caravan wrests the remnants of his weapon from the monster's clutches and attacks it again. He succeeds, but it does not stop Suho. In a complete rage, the imp throws the half-alive southern king through the window. After pushing him into a corner, he tells him how he wanted to taunt his daughter, but he thought of something better. Using one of his inventions, Rin soon turns into an incredible monster. He knows that Caravan wanted to kill the girl at birth with his own hands, but he used those memories for his own benefit. Suho also enraged Carr to destroy all of hell with his own hands. The South King creates a tornado that can be seen from everywhere. Solhel wants to get Irene out of the palace as soon as possible, as such exposure to demonic energy can be very harmful to her. But the bird that Irene burned flies out of the princess's chest. It flies toward the tornado, and the girl tells everyone to follow it. At first, the idea seems ridiculous to the others, but when they realize Irene's intention, most of them agree. The loss of the South King and his daughter could not be tolerated, so they went with her to make sure she would be protected in any situation. Selena's battle continues. She was surprised that Suho was able to make such a strong creature out of her mana, but the whole situation drives her crazy. The ruler goes to extremes and uses a copy of the punishing black fire. With its help, she wins this battle. Rejoicing in her long-awaited victory, Selena is unaware that she is standing on the edge of a cliff. She accidentally falls into the abyss, but someone uses magic to lift her back up. When the sovereign lands, she notices Solhel and Zalf. The North King informs her that they have found Irene, and the princess leaves to find the East King and Kara in the tornado. Suho tells Rin that her father will die because the tornado will hurt him first, and then it will destroy everything in hell. When he tries to attack the girl, Ryan protects her from being hit. He asks the princess to find the southern king while the knight distracts the monster. Irene thinks of a way to get into the tornado without any trouble, and Igel, Irene's bird, comes to her aid. Afterwards, she finds herself in an unknown place. There, the girl sees her father, but is attacked by dark silhouettes beside him. She bravely overcomes them and realizes that they are preventing her from approaching the king. The silhouettes whisper that she must receive the divine power that comes from Rin. Carr begins to speak of his encounter with Sain. He has failed to be a good husband, and he failed to be a good father. He cannot forget that he tried to kill his own daughter. That is unforgivable. These thoughts tormented him. Throughout the memories, he hears Irene. Her eyes always reminded him of Sain. When his daughter asks him if he regrets meeting her mother and himself, he says no, there is no reason to. In an attempt to save her father, Rin enters the darkness herself. It was her only option. The king has no time to stop her because of his impressions. The princess thought it was the end of her, but it wasn't. Grabbing his sword, Carr pulls Rin from the trap of darkness. He will never let anyone hurt her again. The king uses every means to protect his daughter. The evil force will not be able to take the princess. Her father will protect Irene. The tornado disappears. There were no casualties and the South King and his daughter returned alive. This news infuriates Suho, who must destroy them. Suddenly, Rin hears Irene. She is the only one who can see them. Irene tells him to use his sword to defend himself because only he has the power to defeat the demon. Irene trusts her words and takes the sword. She tells Kara and Ryan to stand behind her. With the help of the celestial and evil spirits, the princess manages to defeat the Eastern King. Finally, he asks Ganto for help, but it is too late. He went to the scream and saw Irene with his own eyes. This could not be unless someone else had taken her divine punishment. But why was she with the little girl? Did they have any connection? The evil spirit appeared behind Gainto. He knew that the boy was trying to become a god. He had to be fully punished for such actions. The evil spirit grabbed Ginto and went to work. 
but he quickly took the black crystals that gave him such power from Suho. After that, Ginto, Caravan, and Rin are left alone in a strange place. Gaintho asks Caravan to remember him, and he remembers that he stole something precious from him as a child. But when the king asks him what he wants to achieve by doing so, he advises him to ask the evil spirit. He remarked that they were only toys in Cassius's hands and that he could throw them away if he wanted to. After thanking Carr and Irene, Gainto leaves. At the end of the war, Irene noticed changes around her. Many people's lives were very different from before the war. Some people were rethinking their attitudes toward different people, and using her spiritual powers, Irene disappeared again. Before that, she said that many more friends would see her in Irene and try to meet her. But she must remember that she is a different person and will never become Irene. The evil spirit called all the kings together to announce some important news, but it was most unexpected for all of them. He appointed Irene as the new Eastern king. She would be the youngest ruler in history. Neither Celine nor Irene were happy about it. But by chance, Keita enters the room. After asking him a few questions, both girls find a solution to the situation. Keita became the new king of the Eastern demons. Liban began to regain consciousness and swore an oath to the new king. One night, the caravan king was visited by Ryan, who asked him to punish him for not protecting Irene. This made his father even more suspicious of him, so he asked him to be his daughter's obedient dog, and that would be enough. Rin began to spend a lot of time with her father again, and did not notice the time since her arrival in hell. Like Irene, she kept a personal journal. Irene's ninth birthday was approaching, so it was necessary to plan the day of the party. Many demons wanted to attend the party, but for their safety, she decided to hold it by invitation. All night long, she and her maid sent out invitations through the magic circle. Before the celebration, the king gives Rin a dress of incredible beauty and asks her to follow him. He leads her into the hall where everyone wishes the princess a happy birthday. This reminds her of her past life of sorrow. She is glad that she wanted to move on. As she blows out the candles, she wishes she could stay with these people forever. In the beginning, there was nothing. There was only the creator. In the eternal void, he created light, and with it came darkness. The creator saw the fear and sadness in their hearts. He feared that in the future there might be a war between the light and the darkness. So he took a part of each of them. And by combining them, he created something entirely new. This was called the core. The creator commanded the three beings to awaken their own worlds. He was pleased with all of them, except the darkness. Out of jealousy, a war broke out between the light and the darkness. Observing this, the core decided to turn all attacks upon himself in order to end this confrontation. Though the war was over, parts of them and their world still travel through the universe. The light and the dark have long regretted what they have done. After reading this book about the creation of the world, Sokol comes to the conclusion that the dark crystals the scout spoke of are the particles that travel through the universe. He also learns that the name of the destroyed deity of Viria is Irene. He had almost forgotten Irene's birthday, so he had to make her a present. She had to like it. Together with him, Solhel will give her the book mentioned above. An argument starts between Evil Spirit and Lu. During the war, Cassius failed to punish Gainto and take away Irene's parts. Because of this, he put Irene in danger, but in vain. Cassius promises to take care of it and asks Lu to help his granddaughter if necessary. While watching Irene, the Evil Spirit spotted Ryan. He remembers that he used to be Irene's bodyguard. Cassius remembers how he asked the creator for her rebirth and lost her again as a result. The grandfather decides to give something special to his granddaughter. In the morning, Niang is the first to notice that Miss Rin has turned into a child. She immediately reports this to the king and Ryan, although no one knows what to do. Everyone thinks it's important to tell the princess how cute she is. On that occasion, the South King called the others to his palace for a discussion. The only person who could have done this to Rin was the evil spirit and only he can restore her to her normal state. Cassius is pleased with the reaction of the others to Irene's transformation, so he decides to give her another gift, perhaps his last. The king had another dream, in which a dark force reminded him to return the black crystals to their owner. He could not remember what he had done as a child, who he was. This time Rin has turned into an adult girl. Ryan is sure that Irene has finally returned, but he's wrong. The princess is outraged by the knight's behavior. Earlier, he had wanted to protect her, but now it was clear that he was in love with her, perhaps because of his connection to Irene. Solhel, Ryan, Carr, and Rin visit Cassius's palace to discuss the sudden change in their granddaughter's appearance. The ghost explains that he simply fulfilled the girl's birthday wish, and then she will return to normal. Seeing Irene, Selina decides to take her on an unscheduled shopping trip. When they returned, the king and Ryan were not pleased with the princess's appearance. 
As the knight escorted her to her room to change, he apologized for the passionate embrace that morning. He realized that Rin and Irene were different people, but in that moment, they were very much alike. The princess decides to use her magic to escape the palace with Ryan. They end up in a nearby canyon. Rin tells Ryan that he is part of her family. This makes him remember his relatives. Relations in his family were bad, and his parents fought constantly. After her husband cheated on her, Ryan's mother went insane. She died in front of her son. Then he decided to get revenge on his father. Later, he killed his own father with his own hands and took his legendary sword. But the feeling of anger never left him. It was then that he met Irene. She seemed like a common thief, but he decided to help her. That night, he dreamed again of his mother, who accused him of cursing her family. His hands were covered with blood up to his elbows. But something was different from all the previous dreams. Some unknown force stopped the accumulation of negative memories. This time, he could sleep peacefully. Ryan fought with strangers again, but this time, Irene handled the situation differently. In some unknown way, she learned the details of the attacker's life and used some magic on him, causing him to stop and leave her. During a walk by the sea, Irene tells Ryan what happened in his dream, though she could not know. He quickly realizes that the mysterious bird from the dream was a girl. Then, after finding the black crystal, Irene began to cry. Ryan remembered his mother and how he hadn't been able to help her, so he supported the girl in that moment. From that moment on, he decided to follow his destiny and made a Tai Chi oath to Irene. But it didn't last long. The largest state, Corden, was attacked by monsters, and Irene saved it, after which she disappeared. She was given the title of Messenger of Immortality and Light. Ryan was sure that she was still alive, because if she wasn't, he would have died too. Such were the rules of the Tu Zen Oath. But his heart still beat. When he met Rin, he promised himself he would never leave her. Cassius first saw Kara when the boy was burying his relatives who had been killed by the devil's followers. He offers to avenge them, and the boy agrees. The Northern King learns that Gaintho has collected almost all of the crystals. The last one is in Irene. Social lures Cassius out with a lie, and in Kara's presence, she tells him of the plan to resurrect Irene. The evil spirit wanted to use the Southern King and his daughter to bring Irene back to life. He mentions that he would then have to get rid of Irene. The Southern King does not tolerate these words. After the first rebirth of Irene, the creator does not give her a second chance. So Cassius decides to bring her back himself. He and Luke then secretly sneaked into the creator's library to learn how to recreate Irene. There, the evil spirit learned that she had been created from his and Luke's ribs. To achieve this balance of darkness and light in one being, a child from the union of a demon and an angel is necessary. He found the soul of Irene, who was serving a divine punishment in another world. Then they began to prepare the demon and the angel from infancy. The fate of Kara and Sion was predestined. Cassius also sends the future king in search of a crystal and orders him to swallow it for great power. So Kara has been given a whole new life and opportunities. He and Sain plan to have a child, but she cannot withstand the power of the two energies, so she dies in childbirth, giving her life to her daughter. The last remaining step is the crystal, now in Gento's possession. But Kara is not satisfied with her father's plans and attacks him. He is ready to kill him, but he cannot. Kara will not kill his relative. Karius realized that Kar would never do such a thing because of his life's journey, so if he hadn't learned of the plan, he wouldn't have harmed him. It was all planned down to the last detail. But Kar does not follow his father's plan. He takes Irene with him and leaves hell forever. On the hunt for the Queen of the Western Demons, the princess asks Ryan if he realized from the beginning that she was Irene's reincarnation. But Selina suddenly interrupts the conversation. The knight only says that it is unchangeable. Irene begins to doubt Ryan even more. The princess returns to the palace and finds her father in her room. He tells her of his decision to return to Wyria. Before she can say anything to him, he leaves her alone. Irene decides to seek Solhel's advice and tells him about recent events. He advises her not to worry about moving unexpectedly, as it is not worth the loss of trust between her and her family. This dialogue makes the North King think about the evil spirit's plan. Will it work, and what kind of relationships will be formed between the other kings as a result? As Irene says goodbye to everyone, she gives her necklace to Niang. There were people around her who were important to her and whom she hoped to see again. The king, Harjen, Ryan, and Irene returned to the airy. While Raphael prepared breakfast for the princess, the king said that the reason for his return was to protect Rin. It was clear from the conversation that he and the evil spirit had had a falling out related to these events. The caravan asks Rael not to tell the Holy Lord about this conversation. At this time, Taisha and Lily come to the caravan to ask about the rent and Irene notices them. 
They are happy to see each other after a long time. Aunt Shah suggests that they call Rega since he's near the palace now. Dragon became the head of the Emerald Trade Association. Although Taisha was in charge, he was happy with his position. After receiving a call from his aunt, Rega quickly arrives at the palace. He does not believe that Rin has returned. The necklace he gave her on her last birthday in the underworld was left in hell by the princess, which angered the boy. It was enchanted so that Rega would be the first to know if she used it to return to Wyria. Irene tells the boy how she made friends in hell and got a pet. He mentions Ryan, who is already standing behind him. The dragon does not like the knight and is surprised that Rin still spends time with him. Kalo calls Taisha and asks her to tell the princess that he misses her. He tells her that she has returned with the help of Mana. Irene and Lily go to see him, meeting his wife Asia on the way. She knew about their visit and was happy to bring them home. Kello wants to talk to Rin alone, so she goes to his office. He wonders if Ryan knows about the princess's relationship with Irene. What he feared so much has happened. The knight had known about the connection for a long time, but Kello decided to tell Irene about Ryan's past when he killed his entire family and the Tuzang clan. While the others waited for the girl, Rega interrogated the knight for information about his life. There is definitely a hidden hatred between them. But Asia wants to talk to Ryan, so they leave. She knows about the search for Irene and remembers the last time she saw her on the day of the battle with the ghost. They talk about Luke. He recently visited Kello with Asia and hopes to see Irene again on his journey. As Irene and Regi walk, the guardian knight reminds the princess that she and her father must soon leave on business. She thinks of ways to get the truth from him about his past. Kar and Rin go into town to spend some time together. The daughter is happy to see her father smiling again. Asking if the princess would like to eat, she takes the king to a place where meat is being cooked. But he takes her to a restaurant where real aristocrats eat. There they sit on a terrace reserved for others and order their food. But still, this person who had reserved their place comes in. Not satisfied with the aristocrat's behavior, Carr challenges him. Everyone is alarmed, but Irene tries to figure out how to keep an eye on her father. Remembering Egil, she uses him to spy on him. She sees the king quickly calming the screaming aristocrat and asking the waiter for the bill. Carr gives him 10,000 zloty, which turns out to be too much, and asks him to take into account the delivery of the man's house and orders him to take the rest as a tip. The waiter recognizes the stranger by his aura as the demon king. As a child, he had to hide in a room from his visit. The demon family was on their way to another location, but Irene recognized the knight. He was the one who saved her in the forest ten years ago. He uses tracking magic to be sure. But the caravan king notices the spy's mana and attacks her from behind. The knight can't figure out who they are, but the man's gaze haunts him. Carr takes Irene to a place where he and San used to spend a lot of time in the evenings. He tells Rin about it, and she wonders how they met, and what would have happened if her mother had lived. But his thoughts begin to turn negative. Rin's demonic aura has increased, so Gainto has managed to take control of the demon king's daughter's mind. He manipulates her telling her that she shouldn't have been born and that she knows it. Karu and Sen would be better off without her. This makes the princess cry. Hainto knows that Cassius is passionate about resurrecting the goddess of the realm, so he understands what makes Irene special. He takes the magic from Suho and uses it to take over the princess completely. Rin falls unconscious and finds herself in a dream. There she becomes a student of Nordal, the womanizer of the school. There the student meets Irene. When she was about to fall, a prince picked her up and invited her here. It was Gainto de Oli Brady. With a bad feeling, Rin decided to follow them. Nordahl thought he had lost Irene, but suddenly she ran out from the other side of the corridor. She is followed by Gainto, who looks like a demon. He tells how he once took a crystal from the sky and it gave him power equal to that of the gods. The prince knew from the beginning who Irene was. He had a plan to explore other worlds and invited the girl to come with him. But Irene does not agree to Gainto's proposal and attacks him. As a result, the entire state of Daoli is set on fire. At this point, Irene wakes up and tells Ryan everything. This was also accompanied by questions, but the knight once again ignored them. He was able to conclude that the mysterious girl from Irene's dreams was advising the princess to go to school. At dinner, the girl tells her father that she wants to go to school, which surprises the others. But the king decides to agree and fulfill his daughter's wish. The next morning, the princess tells her friends about her wish to go to school. Lily was upset because it meant she would be alone again. Reyna told them about a friend of her parents who was the principal of the school. The king knocked at their door. He learned about all the schools in Viria and chose the largest and safest among them. From their brochures, his daughter could choose the one she wanted to attend. Among all the schools, Reg found the school of a friend. It was the one Irene had dreamed of. 
She needed to know everything that was going on there, so they went to visit her. When they arrived, Rin asked if there had been another school there before. But the headmaster was not interested in this question. He had been in his position for 50 years and was not interested in other things. With the help of his cunning, the headmaster enrolls three students, Ryan, Irene, and Rage. The princess will finally be able to study without being judged by others and with her friends. On the day of the opening ceremony, Luli Osman notices the new students. He is confused by Irene's beauty. She was a real fairy. During the ceremony, she is also noticed by the head of the student council, Leonie Chet. He is fascinated by her emerald eyes. He seems very familiar to Rin, but she can't remember who he is. During the first lesson, the flowers of the Deltai school come to them. Luli finds Irene, but Leon orders her to be arrested. They bring her to their office and look into her eyes together. A prophecy has been passed down from generation to generation in the school that a fairy with a mysterious layer and emerald eyes will save them from great danger. Every year they look closely at the freshmen and now they have managed to find her, the savior of the legend. But their joy is cut short by Ryan and Rega. They are unwilling to tolerate such an attitude toward their friend. And in a fit of emotion, Ray insults the student council and takes Rin away. Leon orders to get the files of the newcomers, and they find out that Rin Parjanel is the princess of the state of Parjanel. He did not know where this state was, which was strange to him. But what interests him most is the character of Ryan. Apart from his name, the only thing written in the dossier is that he is the bodyguard of the princess. The way he looked when he and Rega came to pick up Irene caught the attention of the head of the student council. Something was wrong with him. Something was wrong. It is also strange that the dossier states that Rin has seventh level magic, which is the highest level for a human. She is only a first year student and already has such power. The other freshmen, after hearing about the situation with the student council, decide to put Rin in her place, but she won't put up with it again, so she fights back. This makes her late for the next class. As punishment, the teacher asks her to sing a song for her classmates. Without any preparation, she sang as if a real angel had descended to earth. The teacher finds a partner for Rin and asks her to sing the same song. But before she begins, she hears the boy talking to her. After the lesson, he comes to meet her. Nest La Sabri is a priest and a student at the school. No one but Ryan and Ray knew the princess's full name. But this boy asked the girl. Luke, the Holy Spirit and Rin's grandfather, borrowed the boy's body to see his granddaughter. He reports that Carius is missing. This is the first time Irene hears of the fight between Carr and his father and she concludes that it is the reason they have returned to the Outlands. He mentions a plan for which Carius needs the Southern King and his daughter, but he cannot tell her about it. Luke asks Rin to hold out her hands to him. The girl sees her own darkness increasing with time. The Holy Spirit has long known of the princess's characteristics and tells her not to let anyone know that she is the reincarnation of Irene. Many people will seek her out because of this, even the darkness within her. If she needs help, she can turn to Nest and count on him to help her. The boy falls quickly and loses consciousness. The headmaster was nearby and he helps the children, but it turns out he was under Cassius's power. His mind was weakening with each passing day, so he had to finish his work as soon as possible. During lunch, Irene is approached by the student council. They warn her of a punishment and ask her to come to their office at four o'clock. She could say goodbye to her carefree life. When they arrived and sat down at their desks, they were ordered to take a book prepared for them. It contained the rules of conduct, and the history of the Deltai school. It was to be rewritten in one week as a promised punishment. Leone's assistant did not understand why the headmaster had given them such an easy task. During the dialogue, the prince mentioned that he wanted to see Rin more often and left the office immediately. Back at the dorm, Irene's roommate Cindy is happy for her new friend. Rin is not thrilled with the situation around her, and more and more people outside the school are discussing the mysterious picture of the fairy savior Deltai. The mere mention of it irritates her, but it's time for detention. In the study, the princess asks her friends how long they have left and asks them not to leave her alone. This reminds Leon of his little sister. He realizes that the reason for this attention to Rin is the resemblance between them. This is how the Lord compensates for his lack of time for his family, but his attention is drawn to Ryan's gaze. The boy looks at the student council president with angry eyes. Whether the rapprochement between Rin and Leon is the reason is unknown. All he can be sure of is that Ryan is pretty good at hiding his true feelings. Everyone decides to have lunch together at a nearby cafe. There, once again, Irene's ignorance causes a small argument, but she is forgiven because of her status as a princess. She missed home, where there were no such silly rules. Ryan was very popular with his classmates. 
One of them wrote him a letter, but it was immediately crumpled up. The knight's behavior changed slightly, and Rin noticed. During recess, Rega and Irene read the contents of the letter. Aubrey is another aristocrat who writes about her desire to become a lover, and knowing Ryan's background, she offers him as her subject. Nest runs up to them with the news that there is no more room in the library. There is an exam tomorrow, and they need to prepare for it. After some thought, he suggests that they do it in the student council office. They go there, and after a short discussion, they get permission to study here. The only thing Leone asks is that Irene sit closer to him so that the prince can see her. Rin is a few pairs short on her worship exam. The professor asks her to find Krista and sing a song with her, but Leone responds by volunteering to take her place. The others did not like the chairman's attention to the princess, but they managed to create a resonance. This amazed the professor, for no one else could create such a bright light. Irene and the student council group spend time together, but she has to leave them to study for the next exam. She returns to the office where Leon is already sitting. He asks her if she has a fiancé and proposes an engagement. Rin's friends come to the office and defend her without understanding the situation. The head of the student council kissed her on the forehead without her permission, which is unacceptable. Reg is not interested in this tradition because he and the princess have promised to marry when the time comes. Ryan warns Leon that in their land of Parginel, it is not allowed to arrange an engagement before the age of 15. The knight has a plan to get around this but the student council president is not interested in the traditions of their state. The guard tells Leon about the peculiarities of his life, that his father is gifted with the power of golden dragons, but the son himself has nothing to become the heir to the throne, for he's an ordinary man. His title of prince is nominal. This behavior infuriates Leon, and he orders them to leave the office immediately. On their way to the dormitory, they are caught by the self-appointed prince's aide and asked to explain what they had dared to say to his chairman. After hearing the details, he challenges Ryan to a duel. They meet at the school's training grounds and begin the fight. Rin's attention is drawn to Triss's red eyes. They were glowing red, like all demons. The Audley family explains that they were born on a red moon. This is their peculiarity. Ryan easily defeats his opponent and returns to his dorm with his friends. The next day, they meet with other members of the student council. They ask him to explain what happened in their absence. Leon does not leave the student council office, and Triss does not leave the court to practice, which surprises them. Ryan only says that he was protecting Rin, and this is the result of his actions. Irene feels guilty about this, so she asks Rage and Ryan to join Triss and goes to talk to Leon. He is alone in his office. The princess manages to get through to the student council president and apologizes for Ryan's behavior. But Leon needs no apology. He believes the guard was right about him. Now Rin is trying to prove to him that he is worthy of the throne. His words are full of insecurity and disappointment in himself. The princess says that Leon should pay attention to what others think of him. There is no one who loves the student council more than he does. Therefore, he must love himself as much as he loves his work. These words touch him and remind him of his mother. Rin manages to cheer Leon up and asks her to call the other student council members to her office. After passing all the exams, the girl and her friends decide to go to the temple. There, the elite of the school are having a party in honor of the first exam of their lives. The tense atmosphere between them dissipates as time passes, and they have a good time. Leone joins them and offers to play chess with Ryan. To motivate them to win, the student council president suggests playing on a whim. He borrows a chessboard from Krista, and the game begins. The board has become a real front line. Leone analyzes the game with complete confidence and makes his move. But Ryan makes an unexpected move and kills the president's king he wins the game. Recent events make Leon doubt Ryan's true identity. At the end of the first semester, everyone goes on vacation. But when Irene and Leon talk in front of others, the boy tells the details of the student council fight. He says he proposed to Rin himself. After the chairman's passionate announcements, a black carriage made of the most expensive wood arrives. No one knows who it belongs to. Its owner turns out to be His Highness Parginel. Everyone begins to greet him. They are amazed at his beauty, but they are more interested in why he has such a strong, demonic aura. By getting out of the carriage, Hargenya helped to avoid answering their questions. Finally, Leon gives Rin a jewel from his mother, but unexpectedly kisses her forehead again, infuriating the girl's father. They return home after explaining the rules of greeting. On the way, Nest reminds them of their visit to the temple. Rin must see her grandfather, the Holy Spirit. Outside the hall, she notices the headmaster. He's happy to see her and gives her the dagger of fortune without telling her why. She accepts the gift and places it in her magical environment. 
Rin says that her reason for joining the school was a dream she had about someone she knew. The headmaster, under the guidance of the evil spirit, realizes that Irene's soul is definitely in Irene. The sword he gave the girl was made from small pieces of her father's sword. In a dialogue with the princess, Krista invites the student council to visit her. Irene and Rega tried to change her mind, but she stood her ground. It is not entirely known what King Carr thinks of this, but he allows Rin's friends to visit, so they go to pick her up the next day. At the school, she's introduced to Triss's father, Poulos Audley. He recognizes her. Ten years ago, he and Leone's parents saved her from monsters in the forest. But they conclude that this could not have happened because Rin is only 11. She is taken by the Southern King's aides and friends from hell. To avoid suspicion, she asks Zalf to pose as an ordinary citizen. On the way, the girl realizes that her father has somehow brought her home from hell to Virion. But there were more changes to come. Raphael meets them at the entrance in an unexpected appearance. Triss is fascinated by his new appearance, and as his godmother leads them into the palace, he reflects on his feelings. Outside, Irene questions her uncle and sister about how they moved the palace. Solhel explains that they actually left everything in its original place and used their magic to do so. Everything around them was created by illusion. Inside, the king met them and ordered the maids to show them to their rooms. Hargan had reproduced Niang so that there would be those responsible in hell. But that was a bit of a problem. After seeing the entire palace, Rin's friends want to see the queen. She tells them that she died in childbirth, which reminds Leon even more of his sister. All her family tried to help her fill the void. They are greeted by Selina and Solhel in the living room. The ruler plays her part well, but she is interested in the boy with the burning eyes. She asks him to sit at the table and answer her questions honestly. He quickly admits that he wants Miss Parginelle to be his wife after he becomes king of his country. This tears King Carr apart. He almost attacks him. But Selina tells him, in her own words, that he will be defeated in this matter. This is not the time to discuss this, for Rin is not yet mature enough. But Leon is willing to wait as long as Rin needs. He takes this seriously, and if the princess falls in love with someone else, he is willing to accept her choice. The day ended in tension, and everyone went to bed. At night, Irene practiced her magic and failed again. She decides to go to the training grounds of the palace. There she meets Ryan, who was practicing at the same time. He wonders why the princess is awake at such a late hour, as it is bad for her health. But Rin doesn't like it either, so she tells him to sleep on her lap. Having created a thermal barrier, they sleep until morning. Then Selina announces the beginning of the young warrior's training for the entire palace. Rin does not like this, and Ryan offers to take her to the palace, but Leon beats him to it and takes the princess in her arms. This action irritates Reg, so he orders her down. Leon confronts Irene with the choice of whom she will choose to help her. From the forest, the monster can be seen, who saw the princesses and their company earlier. It grabs Irene with its long tongue. Ryan and Rhea join forces to help their friend. But out of nowhere, the monster is attacked by Rhea's pet, Rega. He saves his owner and is very happy to see her. Because of their long absence, Raphael and the others pay them a visit. They needed to gather pomegranates for cookies, and she and Triss solve the problem by making a sauce with leftover honey. He is definitely in love with Rael, and the other members of the student council notice and start making fun of him. This makes him angry, but little does he know that his love for his godmother, Rin, will never blossom. A week later, Irene's friends are back in their home. They all thank the Parginelle family for their hospitality, especially Leon. He was grateful for all the memories they had made together. He will be in his senior year next year, and they will not be able to see each other, so the chairperson really appreciates the time they have spent together. She thanks everyone in return, and so ends the princess's first vacation. The attention to Rin does not disappear even in her fourth year. The rumors about the fairy are still a hot topic of discussion, but the princess is doing well. She arranged to meet Ryan and Nest at the training ground. The knight had begun teaching his own swordsmanship classes, though he was still a student at the school. When they meet, Rin's friend Jenny suggests that they form a fairy defense club. She's excited about the idea and has already prepared an application form. The princess is willing to join. She remembers how someone tried to steal Lily before and how much damage it did, so she understands the need to protect these little creatures. Ryan, whom she met for the first time then, mentioned that she needed permission from the headmaster, so they meet again that evening at Mirror Lake. Jenny leads them into the thicket. A mysterious house appears behind her when she uses her magic. She suggests they use it as an office for the Defenders Club. Rin is interested in the owner of the house. Her friend shows her a document in which Jenny is listed as the owner and it is signed by an unknown KF. If this contract exists, then the girl must know this person. It's been a while since the club was founded. There are things to be done, but everyone else is busy, so Rin walks home alone. 
She gets lost in the woods and is frightened by a dark power. It was Lily on her way to find Irene. Someone wanted to meet with her to discuss important information. The fairy queen herself came to see the student. She had heard a lot about the girl from Lily and came to ask for help. Irene realized that C.F. had made a pact with Jenny, the ruler of Fairyland, who now stood before her. A number of fairies had recently been stolen. They were astral animals, the queen found out. She asks Rin to help her find them, and she is sure that they are hiding on the grounds of the academy. This situation threatens the existence of the fairies in the future, so Irene must be careful. The queen leaves her her pollen and Lily to help her. A plan of action is needed to save them. But then Jenny and Larrick came to see her. The boy wanted to join the club, so his friend brought him into the study to discuss it. Jenny had even brought a small cake for the occasion. Lily, who had been hiding behind Rin, sees it and can't stand it. This fruity treat was worth her attention and taste. This impresses Larrick, and he immediately shows all his respect for the creature. After a little communication, the group of main characters can plan their actions to help other fairies. Ryan knows of dark sorcerers who can control astral animals. They are definitely involved, but if they find out, it will be harder for them to complete the mission. Lily will help them go unnoticed while they search for the criminals. She will use the Fairy Queen's magic to find the animals. The next day, you will find a camouflaged wall with a staircase behind it. This was most likely where the wizards were. Before they go there, they have to disguise themselves. Rin dresses them in the costumes Harjan gave them, and they begin to descend into the room. There they find the dark sorcerers. To avoid traps and find the fairies as quickly as possible, they use the pollen of the fairy queen and leave. There were already too many enemies in this room, so Ryan decides to neutralize them himself. Rin helps him, and they are left alone with the fairies. After opening the cages, one of the fairies informs them that there are more fairies deeper in the room. The group decides to split up while Rega and Lily take the others into the forest. Ryan calls for Princess Irene again. Irene begins an intimate conversation about why he is with her, how early he knew about the rebirth, whether his vow was sincere to the king's daughter, not Irene. But again, there are no answers. Together, they go down deeper and find the room where the unsaved fairies are. Rin enters the room in a distressed state and notices something strange on the floor. The fairies were dead. Ryan notices a large aquarium with Eldarin, the water ghost. It gives off a strong, dark energy, indicating that it is under the control of a dark sorcerer. He calls to them, and the heroes notice the dark lion beside him. Their realization surprises him, for he cannot sense them because of the queen's pollen, even though he can see them right in front of him. The sorcerer leaves his lion with them. Rega is ready to fight and asks Ryan to take Rin and Lily away. At the aquarium, the fairy notices that Eldarin is getting darker by the minute. If he loses his true color, he will disappear. They cannot let that happen, so Irene draws her sword. Only divine power can overcome darkness. With it, the water spirit was able to return to his natural place. This means that the dark lion can also be defeated with Rin's sword. She begs Rogue to let it go, but the boy has a plan of his own. The girl tries to hold the beast with gravity magic, but fails. The lion leaps at Irene, but Ryan takes the hit. At the same time, Rega casts a spell and the monster is trapped. The princess wastes no time in cleansing the enchanted creature of its power. Now the lion is free from the influence of dark magic. Having done so, Rin runs to Ryan to heal him, but they are approached by a new enemy. This enemy is one of the fairy protectors, Leorath. He has been enchanted while checking the area around him. Due to the number of dead fairies in the area and the threat of other dark wizards, the dungeon must be destroyed. This was done by Rega, and he returned to his friends in the Northwoods. They bury the dead, and Leorath cannot help but feel guilty. At his request, the Fairy Queen punishes him by stripping him of his title as defender of her kingdom. Finally, she asks him to protect Rin, Ryan, and Rogue. He accepts with honor. The Queen gives him a magic pouch and returns home with Lily. The Corden family learns of the explosion on the grounds of the Deltai Academy. They investigate the situation and make an interesting discovery. According to the results of the investigation, they turn out to be the wings of a real fairy known from legends. Texas suspects that Rin is involved in this, so he will look for any information about her. More than the princess, he is interested in the girl's red-eyed father. Cordan will do anything to see him again and set up a fight. In the dormitory, Rin wakes up the day after helping the queen. Her roommate asks why there is a dog in the room which surprises the heroine. It was Leorat, who had nowhere to go, so he turned into a puppy and left with Rin. Cindy promises not to tell anyone about him, and the princess and her new pet begin packing. To thank her, Elderon, the spirit of water, appears in her room. He is convinced that the girl's blood is half demon and half angel. But that is not the only reason she was able to save him. 
The girl's energy resembles that of an old friend, which transforms Elderon from an evil scoundrel into an obedient dog. He is grateful to Irene for her help and wants to make a treaty with her. The contract is made so that the ghost can stay in the world where his owner, the princess, lives. The reason for this was Eldarin's interest in the girl's special energy. She is not satisfied with this and demands that the contract be canceled. In expressing her indignation, Rin compares the spirit to Ryan, which makes him wary. At lunch, Eldarin mentally tells the princess that he and the knight used to be friends. But at some point that changed and they became enemies. He aptly notes that Ryan is with Rin because she is the reincarnation of Irene. This is very clear to him. It is Irene's energy that is similar to Irene's. He tells his owner that many people in this world knew Irene, but even here she and Ryan were special. Together they were her bodyguards. They were in the same group and socialized together, but something caused them to drift apart. At the spirit's request, Rin asks Ryan if he feels remorse for actions that were not available to others. When he answers yes, Elderon divorces him. He says what he thinks to the knight's face, remembering how he personally led Irene to her death. When the monsters entered the underworld, there were ways to defeat them. Irene could either take on the burden of self-sacrifice or join forces with other mages to defeat the threat. All of Ren's other guards were against sacrifice, except for Ryan. He thought it was a worthy price to pay, but she obeyed him and died as a result. After this story, Irene needs to talk to the knight. His own thoughts were destroying him from within. Ryan didn't want to see anyone, so when he heard Rin's voice, he asked her to leave him alone. But the princess needs an answer, and the knight reacts by striking her. The realization came quickly, and there he was, running to justify himself and beg her forgiveness. Everything Rin asked him before was true. He tells her how his Tuzang clan turned into greedy bastards, causing his mother to commit suicide. He tells her how he cut out the clan with his own hands and wandered through the worm, trying to feel something other than emptiness. But then he met Irene, and he swore that he would always protect her. But when the evil monster attacked Wyrium, she gave her life to save her world. Everyone around her was against that decision, but Ryan couldn't talk Irene out of it out of respect for her. He realized then that he had willingly sent her to her death. But only he knew that Irene had not died at the end of that decisive battle. If she had, the oath would have been broken and Ryan would have died with her. But as he wandered the world again, he met Irene. He felt that by making the oath to the girl, he would continue to protect Irene. Of his own free will, he begins to tear it apart. After that, any knight is not worthy of forgiveness and would one day be thrown out by all of them. Tearing it would have meant that Ryan would have died immediately afterwards. But the girl has other plans. She slaps him and begins to prove that she is the only one who can break their relationship. She is his mistress and gives him orders. His past has nothing to do with Irene. She doesn't care how many mistakes he made before. He is now the knight of the princess. They resolve the misunderstanding peacefully. Rin begs him not to say such things again. Finally, they swear an oath on their little fingers. There is one caveat. All this time, Rega, Leoraf, and Eldiron have been listening to their conversation. The dragon becomes even more jealous of Irene's bodyguard. During a break between classes, the princess decides to tell the water spirit about Irene, how she appears in the girl's dreams and helps her. Because of the constant references to Irene and comparisons to her, even from the spirit itself, she asks if she might be Irene's reincarnation. Although Eldiron believes that Ren's soul is lost in Irene's body, he also believes that the princess is unique. It is possible that there are two souls in her body. One is Irene, and the other is Princess Irene. This is not possible, but he has never seen thoughts from a past life say anything to the present. A festival was coming up at the academy, and the magic faculty could not decide what to organize. The choice was between tarot and a cafe, but after Rin's opinion, the final decision was made. They will organize a tarot cafe. Jenny will be in charge of the tarot, as the cards are an integral part of her family's development. She takes Rin with her and leaves the organization of the cafe to Risa. The next day, while walking the corridors of the academy with Jenny, the princess notices her classmates bullying another student again. She reminds them of their agreement to live together until graduation, and they run away from Irene's sight. The victim is history student Miley. Rin's sincerity does not impress her, so she leaves her in silence. In her freshman year, she was ranked first in the entire academy for her efforts in her studies. In the evening, the fairy defenders walk to their hut. Out of nowhere, a fainting girl falls in front of them. Ryan picks her up and offers to take her to the house for help. It was Miley who fell down the hill. 
Eldiron tells Rin that she was pushed by the same girls who were harassing the student in the hallway. But she doesn't remember any of this. Miley doesn't need any help. None of this is being done out of the goodness of her heart. She refuses to tell the professor about the incident. It's just between her and the professor. Since childhood, other nobles have treated the girl the same way and then abandoned her. This has formed her opinion of this society. Miley doesn't want to hear a word about the exclusivity of Rin's friends and hurries to leave them. But Ryan tells her that he is an ordinary person just like her. Despite the attitude of the nobles as a child, he found himself in their company. Rin and the others are not like that. You must look at a person's behavior, not their status. These words touch the disciple and she gives them a chance. At night, Caravan and the other kings camped outside the academy. It was necessary to ensure their daughter's safety at the festival, even though it was still a week away. Selina looked at the carriage with its strange but familiar silhouette. All that remained was to wait for the event. The professor already knows what Setra and her friends have done. The question of their future studies at the academy will not be considered, and each of their parents has received a letter from the committee inviting them to a disciplinary hearing and forbidding them to attend the upcoming festival. The king comes to the festival. It's impossible to guess where the Faculty of Magic is because of the crowd outside. Hargain searches for people who might know where Rin is, but to no avail. Confused, he feels Irene's energy and runs to the tent. But it was a false sensation. The servant was surprised, but the girl tells them the location of the faculty. She had Irene's mana crystal, which Irene now has. It was the stone that confused Harge. Hopeful, she used it to find Irene herself. Leone enters Irene's tent. The cards tell the story of the boy's passionate love, which helped him cope with the difficulties but the purpose of his visit was to talk to Irene in person. He offers to spend the festival together and waits for her shift to end. Leon kisses the princess on the forehead as he takes his leave and leaves the tent. Emperor Chet of Liberia arrives at the academy in secret. No reason is given, but the visit must go unnoticed. Together with Fricks, they enter the main courtyard. The image of a red-eyed man in a black robe catches the emperor's attention. He decides to follow him. The new visitor, Irene, seems very calm. The reading begins when she interrupts it, deftly pulls out her own deck and begins to read Rin's past. She had everything she ever dreamed of. But when faced with a choice, she chose the harder path, leaving her loved ones behind. And now, after many years, she has returned to them. Before Rin can ask who she is, she feels the girl's kiss. The princess is shocked. She tries to catch up with the stranger and is helped by Eldirin. Irene realizes that the stranger described Irene's past and already knew about reincarnation. This stranger was Silice. The water spirit knew her, and the visit meant that she had returned with her people. Debri tells Ryan about the girl with purple hair and a mole under her lip that Rin ran after. The knight must find her and help her. He leaves the tarot cafe for the guy with Miley. Meanwhile, Rega notices some old friends of his. They have come to see how their friends are doing with this year's festival. Leon sees the emperor, who has also come to the academy. The tension between them is palpable. And Liberi is not happy to see his successor spending time with his friends when he has business at the castle. Frix finds out that the children have come to visit their friends from the student council, namely Rin Parjanel. Liberi finds a man dressed in a black robe. Carr does not recognize him, but the emperor reminds him of their two previous encounters. Afterwards, the king and Harjen find themselves in a barrier. Liberi knows that Parjanel is not human. Ryan finally finds Silas. One day, a star lights up in the sky pointing to the academy. For the Harbinger, this meant only one thing, the return of the savior. So she reunites with her old friends to meet Irene. Irene finds the stranger and the knight together on the street. They were talking as if they knew each other, which was not surprising. The princess shows her irritation to Kalis. She likes it and offers to walk with her. Before she leaves, she wishes they could meet again if the god of fate so chooses. Ryan and Rin must return. But the princess wants answers to her question from the knight. He has grown colder towards Irene since the day in the forest, which frightens her. She insists that Ryan treat her as he treated Irene. Suddenly something unknown happens to Rin. A dagger given to her by the headmaster flies out of her magic safe. It flies into the academy and can harm people nearby. Liberi challenges King Parginal to a duel. Carr orders Harjan to find his daughter and protect her. Meanwhile, a battle begins within the barrier. The emperor is impressed by the speed of the enemy's attacks. He has been preparing for this battle since he first met him. After calculating the king's strength, he has created a weapon to thwart him, a magic whip. Throughout the territory created by Liberi, a dagger falls into the hands of Kar. It becomes the sword of the king, Raksharitz. It was broken in the battle with the demon Suho, but now it is back in its owner's hands. 
With its help, Parjanel quickly finds himself near the Emperor and strikes him. Jenny leads Harge to her tent. He does not find Rin there and tells Ragi of the current situation. Together, they continue their search for the girl. Carr wins the battle. Now it is necessary to transfer his daughter to another school because it has become clear that Cassius is watching the Deltai Academy. This could lead to something bad. Now they must find Irene. Carr and Ray find the princess near the stairs. Ryan and Leon argue as they search for the dagger. But it didn't matter anymore. Irene met her father, who she missed so much. She told him about the lost thing, but the joy on the king's face made her forget. As a group, they went to watch the festival and relax. All day long, Rin has only seen a tent cloth, so she's happy to just walk to the school grounds. There is cream from a waffle on the girl's cheek. Ryan cleans it up and immediately apologizes. But the princess doesn't need an apology. She just hopes that one day he will be like Silas said he would be. A kiss on the forehead will become their greeting tradition. Jealousy overwhelms Reg, and he catches up with Ryan. But the situation is saved by a crowd of people running toward them. The girl grabs the boy's hand to keep him from getting lost. He is surprised by this, but does nothing. Leon approaches and offers to hold Rin's hand if the poor dragon can't manage it. To avoid constant conflict, the king takes Irene with him and they spend the rest of the day together. When Leon and Triss return, the princess remembers her gifts for the others. She gives her father and Hargain models of a Pegasus and a Fenrir because of their resemblance to those animals. But the present for Reg was special. When she saw a small flower shop at the festival, she remembered the first time she met her friend. She gave him a handmade crown. Rega is Irene's first friend, with whom she has many childhood memories. After all these years, they are still together. This speech made Reich cry. He needed to be calmed. Miley, returning from the festival, encounters Setra and her friends. The abuser wants to make the student's life a living hell. The next day, before the Tarot Cafe opens, Rin's lost friends visit her. They had been to many places on the first day and enjoyed the festival. Selena wants to go to the swordsmanship school and invites Irene. The girl remembers how Ryan said earlier that he had to prepare something for today's event. The faculty has prepared an auction of knights called Oh My Lord. In it, anyone can buy a knight and be his master for the duration of the festival. The highest bidder takes the desired knight. Ryan entered the auction. His candidacy drew immediate attention. Rena could not allow anyone to take her knight for a while. She waits a few minutes and then places a bid. But it's no use. Others are willing to bid much more, and she can say goodbye to Ryan during the festival. But Parjanel's father makes an incredibly high bid. The field is filled with silence, and Rin Parjanel becomes the owner of the Prince of the Red Rose. Miley's situation has gotten much worse. The trio of friends have already started to think about which part of the girl's body to eat first. She cries out desperately for help, but someone hears her. The stranger drives out the dark creatures that have taken control of the girls' bodies. He fights each one skillfully until the stranger has captured the demons. These two are Irene's guards. They have been fighting similar creatures for a long time, more than a hundred years, while Irene was still alive. They came to the academy to find Irene. At the end of the day, Rega escorts the guests to the gate, but Carr senses a dark presence. He tells Rin to hide behind him. Only the evil spirit has the ability to move between worlds without fear. Otherwise, he needs permission, which Carr and the others use. The demons from hell did not have this ability. Ryan and the guardians recognize each other. Severus strikes the knight for his treachery. He had seen him destroyed decades ago. But now Ryan stood peaceful, though he carried a heavy burden. Helga recognized the demon king because Kello had told her about him and his daughter. It was he who had sent her and Severus here. Kello also told her about Ryan, who was protecting someone very important. But he is a weakling and a coward. To avoid problems, it's best to sever all ties with him now. Helga tells Carr about the creatures that emit dark energy. They were discovered by Guyton to take over the underworld. They once lived among the worlds, and nothing is known of their origin. The war against them ended a thousand years ago, but they have found their way back to the underworld. The guard shares her bad feeling about this, and they leave. The king asks Rin to leave the academy. He thought that by leaving her with Ryan and Rega, his daughter would be safe. But the situation is deteriorating rapidly. He will come for her after the festival to take her home. When the girls visit Miley, Dibri tells them that Lady Setru and her friends have disappeared after the last incident. Jenny eased the atmosphere with her visit. She came in a beautiful red dress. The day after tomorrow, the night feast is the biggest event of the annual festival. Helga and Severus watch from the window. The guard realizes that Irene is most likely the reincarnation of Irene that Kello sent them to fetch. This would explain why Ryan is protecting her and living a quiet life again. In the sewers of the academy, an unknown wizard contacts Gainto. 
He tells his king that they have failed to capture Irene's body. For now, Gaintho orders nothing to be done, as Cassius is very cautious. Today is the day of the feast. Solhel gives Rin a dress she really likes, only she can't get over her father's words. Much has happened at the academy. She has made new friends and improved her relationship with her old ones, especially her relationship with Ryan, and her attitude towards him have changed. Liraf listens and concludes that Rin has fallen in love. Even though he didn't know the story was about Ryan, she doesn't know if it's true. In the men's dormitory, Rega plans how to tell his girlfriend how he feels. He hasn't been ready for so many years, so he decides that the night feast will be the perfect opportunity. Leon has also been preparing for the feast. He tried on different costumes and different colors. Triss decided to tell Leon that she loved him, but he didn't see any reciprocation, so he decided to give up and eventually fell in love with Miss Raphael. Using this situation as an example, Triss tried to force the prince to make a decision and give up in order to win Rin's love. Leon's indignation knew no bounds. He had everything he wanted. Therefore, it would be no problem for the prince to fall in love with his favorite girl. Ryan took Irene from her room to take her to the banquet. The picture of the girl was noticed by each of the guests. It remains to dance the first dance. Reg and Leon decide to approach the girl. The princess has to make a difficult decision, but Rin will think of something that will help her not to offend any of the boys. The dance with Rega was strange. Even though he knew that the princess could not dance, his behavior was strange. This feeling did not leave the girl. Rega invites her to talk to him after the event. With Leon, the girl felt more alive. Rumors about the prince's fiance spread as soon as he asked her to dance. But something comes as a surprise. He asks Rin to talk to him as well. On the street, he asks her about the bracelet his mother gave her earlier. The girl's mood changes and she finds the jewelry. The jewelry is more than just a gift, so Irene returns it to Leona. The theme of the dialogue was clear beforehand. The girl says that even before she met the prince, she had found the person she would spend her life with. Triss's advice was appropriate, but Leone's pride had taken over, and he felt terrible. Rin wonders if she did the right thing by the president. She left him in the garden without turning around, but on the other hand, in situations like this, you have to be able to cut off all communication immediately. The meeting with Rega was more positive. Despite everything, the princess tried to joke and laugh, but the boy was in no mood. The dragon takes the initiative and proposes marriage to Irene. She is shocked, although she thought he was in love with her. But that was more than ten years ago. How to react because she doesn't want to lose another friend. At the beginning of the banquet, the professor asked Ryan to come out and talk to him. But that was the plan of the guards, and they wanted to talk. They insisted that the knight leave Irene's reincarnation alone. From their words, it becomes known that Ren herself was also the daughter of the demon king. Everything, her history, her appearance, her actions, reminded him of her. Ryan never forgot Irene, and therefore could not get close to her. She served as a substitute for the old daughter of the king. This truth made the princess weep. All her trust in Ryan was the result of lies and misunderstandings between them. The girl's tears cannot be seen by Rega, so she supports her. Of all her friends, he was the only one who saw Irene in her. An ordinary girl who fascinated him with her eyes and her smile. With whom he always had fun and was interested but he fell in love with her and for many years tried to protect her from various disasters. Nothing was important now except the warmth that a man feels next to his beloved. Once upon a time, little Irene was an outcast. Children humiliated and insulted her because she had no parents. At such an early age, the girl begins to think about the meaning of her life and her origins. One day, a stranger comes to Ren's aid as if to help her. Together, they go to the river. The pain of the waves is unbearable, but the girl continues to follow the man. The stranger warns of difficulties and threats in her future, but she must remain strong. Then a bird called Eagle will follow her and guide her. Ten years later, seeing the threat in her brother's eyes, she consults her servant Ryan. His words had a great influence on Irene's decision. She shows him the near future. Thousands of people will die. The whole country will be destroyed. The knight is afraid of this fate. Irene is the goddess of the fountainhead, and the future of the world is like her own child, which must be protected. She tells the knight of her true origin for the first time, which surprises him. In order to confront Gainto, they search for the magical parts of the statue. This is the only way to defeat Irene's brother. Ryan wanted to tell the other guards all this, but he was quickly stopped by the goddess. It was not that easy because there was a spy among them, Gainto. He had to be identified. The annual festival at the academy has ended today. The knight behaves as usual despite the events of yesterday. He invites Rin to go with him to see Nesta, who is about to perform but Rega refuses the offer. From now on, he and Rin will go to events together as they have started dating. After 10 years of friendship, 
their relationship has reached a new stage. The boy got carried away with the story and did not notice that Lord Caravan was already behind him. Enraged by this information, he is ready to kill the dragon. His daughter is too young for a relationship. But the king has come to the academy to take Rin home. She wants to stay, so to make everyone happy, Ryan suggests that Karu move into the school. That way, he can take care of his daughter and keep an eye on Rega. The king of Liberia pays them a visit. After the battle with the caravan, he discussed the events with an acquaintance of his, and it turned out that he knew the demon. He wants to meet him. A group of students are alone when they suddenly feel a dark energy. Ready to fight, they see only a little girl. This sweet little girl is called Miel. She says that she lost her father somewhere on the academy grounds, so they start looking for him. But they didn't have to search long, because the man found them. The girl's father is Professor Randolph. Students have been missing class because of him, according to Professor Rogan. He asks his colleague whose child it is. They discuss it over a glass of beer. The father begs Rogan to keep Miel's existence a secret. He's not yet ready to reveal the details of his family life. In the evening, Rin returns to the dormitory where she's frightened by Severus. He has come to take the girl to an unplanned meeting, which is done by force. Severus takes her to a cafe where Irene's guards are waiting. Silas wonders how Irene got to know Ryan. After hearing the story, the guard reveals his true intentions. Ryan never swore to Irene that he would protect her. When he joined Irene, his goal was to gain the power of the goddess. It was all an illusion to steal the crystals from the statue. When he met Irene, the boy went with her for the power hidden in her. Once he had achieved his goal, he would get rid of the princess as a useless doll. Silas introduces Rin to the leader of Irene's guards, Jolkin Ashnan. To survive, you must keep Ryan away from you, he advises. After a tense conversation, the leader asks the girl what she wants to eat. She wants chocolate cake. He is then convinced of Silas's theory that Irene is the reincarnation of the goddess of the fountainhead. Simon Dion Nearest, the only relative of his wife, Sane, came to speak with the demon king. The reason for this was a known threat to the royal family, so something needs to be checked. Using light magic, he finds out that the last crystal of Irene is in Kara's body. This would explain the birth of the demon and angel child, the ability to use light magic, and his marriage to Sane. Simon asks the king and his daughter to leave the academy because of the danger. The best place to go, in his opinion, would be hell. But a bird arrives with a letter from Ryan. He reports about Irene's disappearance. As soon as no car finds the boys, the girl is back. Her father was worried and asked where she had been. For a while, the disappearance is denied by a walk due to insomnia. But the knight is suspicious of the girl's words. Rumors spread quickly in the academy. So before Nest has time to suggest that Rin's lover is Crown Prince Leon, a crowd of angry students forms. But the friends manage to get away from them in an unfamiliar office. There they meet Meal. It was Professor Randolph's lab. There, Irene and Razy talk about their relationship. It's been a week since they started, so they don't have the interesting stories the others were looking forward to. Miley wants to see the blonde boy, so she goes out of the lab to see him. She thinks he had a fight with Rin and tells them to talk it out. She feels sick and passes out. Ryan immediately takes Meal back to the office. There, they try to save the girl. She had a rare disease for which her father was looking for a cure. Rin senses the dark energy they felt the moment before they met the girl. The energy came from Meal herself which might explain her poor condition. Making a quick decision, Irene uses the holy sword to cleanse the child's body. She begins to breathe, but her behavior has changed dramatically. The professor returns to his office. Everything was different before he left. He is frightened by his daughter's condition and chases the students away. In the courtyard, they meet Savaris. He saw Rin fighting the dead man. There are creatures like the dead in the world, but the peculiarity is that they died long ago, but exist through dark magic. That was what Miel was. After everyone else has gone to bed, Irene and Rega discuss the day. She feels bad that he has to suffer the consequences of her former life. But the boyfriend assures her that the present her is more important to him than the past Irene. This motivates Rin, even though it's a simple but much needed word. Miel has been on the princess's mind, so she goes to see her with Rega and Leoraf. Elderon helps them with the security of the mission, and they find themselves in Professor Randolph's office. There, Rin is curious about the mysterious door, but Ryan appears out of nowhere and forbids them to go in. It could be dangerous, but the princess doesn't listen to his advice and opens the door. Once inside, they find themselves in another room with the walking dead. The characteristic smell makes it hard for Rin to concentrate. The sorcerer they met in the dungeons of the academy is behind this. He was ordered to steal the girl and give her to the master. At night, Miley asked Debri for help, and they saw Miel in the street. She looked bad and was standing alone, so the boy decided to find her father. But the girl bites him, causing Dibri to lose consciousness. Miley is frightened and tries to call for help, but she is bewitched by Professor Randolph. 
together with the bodies of the students they leave in an unknown direction. Meanwhile, the hellish battle at the academy continues. Rin protects her friends with light magic, but the sorcerer continues to attack. Suddenly, someone manages to rip open the room. Rega uses the dragon's breath to defeat the dark sorcerer, only its true mission was to hold them off while someone else finished their business. As the assailant disappears, Ryan connects Miel to the professor from before. They weren't in the office in the beginning, so they could have escaped during that time. Elderin doesn't feel their energy in the academy either. At breakfast, the friends discuss the situation. Jenny finds them and has urgent news. Alarmed, she tells them about the disappearance of Miley and Debris last night. Neither has returned to their dorm. Raken has arrived in Serdan by order of the Dragon Lord. He must find out where the energy is coming from, which is reminiscent of the war a hundred years ago. It must not happen again. At the academy, they learn about the last time their friends were seen. In the morning, Miley checked out a book from the library. The wizard's words haunt Rin, and she wonders if they have something to do with the students. But Leoraf finds their trail. In the forest, he can't figure out where Miley and Dibri went next. But in Irene's magical room, the fairy queen's pouch catches fire. The pollen can detect nearby dangers, so they use it. The girl finds the barrier and uses a magical reversal to destroy it. Behind it, she can smell her friends and a lot of dark magic. They have to decide what to do next. Ryan decides to go in first and there is no reaction from him. The others go in to check on him. Suddenly, Rega is in the clearing with the Demon King. He says that he has invited the boy to a family tea party. Rin should be here soon. She's a little late and the whole family is resting together afterwards. The day was perfect to be true. Ryan finds himself in the company of the Guardians. Ready for the inevitable battle, Severus rushes him into the hall. Everyone was waiting for them. Yolkin gives our knight the title of Captain of the Guard. He cannot believe it because it could not have happened. Irene herself congratulates him personally. Ray's day was quiet. Carr played with his grandson while his son-in-law and Rin rested. The girl offers him the cake she made for them. When he tastes it, he realizes that it is not the real Irene. During her cooking classes at the academy, no matter how much sugar she added to the pies, they turned out salty. This little thing helps him wake up. He finds friends around him who are still under the influence of the magic of sleep. The use of this magic takes away the vitality of the bewitched. If they do not wish to awaken soon, they will remain in this state forever. Rin finds herself at home in her bed, even though she has just been at the house with Ray and Ryan. But a strange woman is calling her. She does not look like Irene. It is her mother saying, Tonight is to be the first time the lady of the Nalos family will be seen in public. She must look incredible. Randolph is behind this. Rega believes that getting rid of him will put an end to this nightmare. But Miel comes to his defense. She is much stronger than the dragon expected. This is not like the strength of an ordinary seven-year-old child. The professor used the energy of Reg's friends to control his daughter. Ryan realizes that everything around him is an illusion. Irene could never love anyone alone because she understood the responsibility of her feelings. But to wake up, he must make a choice. The princess spent the whole day shopping with her mother. She immediately realized that she was dreaming, but since her mother had died when she was young, she wanted to spend time with her at least once. She is grateful to her for this. The fight between Rega and Miel continues. She is unaffected by the dragon's breath, but the boy quickly finds himself at a disadvantage. Ryan arrives in time to save him. The professor wonders how he managed to wake up, for his dream is better than the others. But Rin has the hardest time. The dream has nearly consumed her and all her mana has begun to leave her body. Scene says that having a daughter has ruined her life. But if she stays with her, she might be able to forgive Irene. The knight rushes to help the princess. He was once in the same situation as Rin, but it is important to realize that one must live in the present, not the past. The girl wakes up and begins to cry. It was she who killed her mother and ruined her life. These thoughts consume the princess, but Ryan cannot let them destroy Irene. All this was done to resurrect Miel. Her mother died in childbirth, as did Sane. She finally begged to keep her daughter alive, but it did not work. Due to a chronic illness, Miel died as an infant. Randolph hoped that Irene would share the pain of losing her loved ones with him, but different values would not allow this. Therefore, the professor will try to turn her into a walking dead. Carr and Harjan arrive in time to help and defeat the monster. The mad professor's plan fails, so he goes to extreme lengths. A self-exploding circle fills the house and will soon blow it up. You must save everyone, but there is not enough time. Having accepted this, they are ready to accept their deaths. But Egil saves them. Unfortunately, the professor and Mio could not be saved. The danger is over for a short time. The dark sorcerer watched. Even though Randolph failed in his mission, the dark power in Irene's body increased. They needed it to reach their goal. Irene knew her destiny from the beginning. She tells Ryan about Irene, 
who will also receive the love of the world, but will also face trials. Aegil will help the knight if he needs it. The dark power in Rin's body will win, and she will not be able to handle it, so she will die. This time has come, so the bird visits Ryan. Rhaega and Rin are left to care for their injured friends. The girl looks depressed, so Dibri tells the dragon to help her. Suddenly, someone knocks at their door. It's Rarick, and at Duke Churden's request, he invites Rhaeg and Dibri to a concert. But one of them is in the hospital, so the dragon is asked to go with Rin to rest. This idea gains momentum, but Rarick has to stop it. Irene was specifically not invited because of the difficulties she might cause. At the hotel, Helga had prepared breakfast for Yulkin and went to take it to his room. When she heard no answer, she went in. Yulkin had been away on business all morning. She leaves her breakfast on the table and leaves the room. She begins to suspect the guide. Rin is waiting for Ray in the town's central square. He asked her out today, but the princess doesn't think she deserves such a relationship. She has never paid attention to a man who would do anything for her. While Irene is thinking about this, she doesn't notice a carriage coming right at her. The woman driving it is outraged by the situation. She threatens Rin and her parents, but a boy comes to her defense. The maid notices a green brooch on his clothes, indicating that the owner of the Emerald Trading Organization is standing before them. To avoid trouble, the countess and the maid begin to apologize to him. But they should have done so in front of the girl. The boy tells them that the unknown girl blocking their way is the princess of the kingdom of Parjanel. They realize their mistake as Rega is already chasing them out of sight. The girl's clothes are dirty from the incident, so Ray takes her to Ramsey's shop. He wants to buy her a gift. Helga says she saw a dark sorcerer's costume in Yulkin's closet. This means that he has betrayed Irene and is submitting to Ganto to take over the world with Irene's help. Silas refutes this with his strange behavior, but the leader will have to explain himself. There should be no traitors among them. The student's parents were watching them outside the theater. When the couple arrived, everyone talked about her beauty. At the entrance, they meet the director of the academy. He is surprised to see them dressed like this and offers them a drink of his own juice. In the hall, they sit next to Leon. There is tension and surprise between them, but tonight they must enjoy the concert. The crown prince's younger sister, Eloise Estina Serdan, performs. The girl's mother died in childbirth. Because of this, the entire palace did not accept the princess. But thanks to Eloise's efforts, this changed in time. Meanwhile, an important meeting takes place in the Celestial Temple. Nest and Simon's mission is to find the evil spirit. Rukian is not satisfied with the results, so the search continues. Cassius was ready to do anything to revive Irene and begged Luke for help, bowing his head. The Holy Spirit was against it, but he realized too late that he was not consciously doing it. Leon introduces her younger sister to Rin. She had heard a lot about her from her brother and was grateful to have the disciple talk to him. After the first meeting with Irene, the crown prince began to warm to his sister. But their conversation is interrupted by Triss. The Cherdan royal carriage has arrived and they must leave. Rin notices a bracelet from Leon's mother on Eloise's wrist. This means that the prince is truly happy now. The drink the director gave them was wine. The drunken Rega could no longer stand on his feet, so Rin had to carry him on her back all the way to the academy. But at some point, the dragon began to speak for her relationship with the princess. From the beginning, he knew who Irene liked. When he confessed his love to her, he already knew what the answer would be. But he was given a chance. And when Ryan's words offended the girl, he took it. But that was all he could do. They started a relationship they didn't want. Rega suggests that they go back to being friends so as not to destroy the trust between them. At the hotel with the guards, Yulkin discusses his mission with Kiram. Suddenly, Severus and Helga burst in. They demand an explanation for what he said to Silas. But the Enlightener did not come to him. No one knew where she was now. After the show, Caravan meets Cassius. He knew that his father had been following him and Rin since their return to Wyria. When the king asks about the princess's past, he learns that Irene was the daughter of the evil spirit. Irene and Rogue are attacked by Gainto and Silas. With the power of a god, Gainto quickly defeats the dragon. Everything goes according to their plan. When the Enlightened One meets Irene for the first time, she kisses the student to leave her mark. With her help, Gainto takes possession of the princess's body. The caravan finds him, but it is too late. His daughter attacks him. The last thing Gaintho needed was the crystal in Quarrel's body. But his plan is foiled by Cassius. He has taken control of his son's body and is waiting for Gaintho to act. Finally, the ghost manages to capture him. From the beginning, Irene and Caravan were mere pawns in Cassius's plan. The girl's body served as a shell for Irene's soul. And when the goddess awakens, Irene's soul will disappear. But this plan was foiled by Ryan. Irene had left him the sword Kai's, which could kill gods. The knight knew it would be necessary to use it because Rin was in danger. He attacks Cassius with the sword. At this time, Gento and Silas manage to escape. 
The boy is angry that part of the plan failed, but now he had what he wanted so badly. Gaintu orders his army to prepare. Viri is attacked by monsters. Irene's followers try to save the other creatures from the clutches of the attackers. Kyram, who rescues the fairies, says that he came here because of the breakdown in communication with Rakan. In the dormitory, Rega tries to find out from Cassius what will happen to Irene. But it is useless. Now he had no power and only disappearance awaited him. He couldn't imagine that Irene's bird was a cat. Ryan, when everyone is gathered in Reg's room, tells of current events. Before she died, Irene told him what would happen after her. She knew about the rebirth, the formation of a group of guards, and the betrayal of one of them. The knight did not tell her this so that the future would not change. He asks her to trust him and do everything according to his plan. In spite of their relationship, they had one goal in mind, to save Irene. Outside a hellish battle rages. The kingdom of Corden is overrun by monsters. You try to save everyone, but you are not strong enough. The emperor decides to go into battle and appoints Leon as his leader. While he and the knights fight the monsters, the prince must save the people of the kingdom. He orders all mages to gather and evacuate the wounded to the safest place. Leon will not allow his land to be destroyed. Ryan asks Rukian to lead them to the world created by Gaintho. Together with the people he has chosen, they will go to rescue Irene. Rega shows the Holy Spirit the magical vault she was about to open just before the attack. Most likely, she was trying to get her sword to defend herself against Gaintho. Eldarin was also there. Rin broke the contract with him and forced him to stay in the vault. In fact, the water ghost became the princess protector at Yulkin's request. Due to the termination of the contract, he returned to his former master, the leader of the Irene Guards. Yulkin had a contract with every strong spirit. Fighting him meant immediate defeat. Now the others understand his power. Ryan reiterates their plan of action and they make their way to Gainto's palace. The Demon King's territory is also being attacked by monsters. Bucklin, Selena's chief assistant, arrives to help Hargan and Raphael. He tells them that a spatial rift has been detected in the demon world, through which demons are entering the underworld. They cannot handle so many monsters alone, but they are joined by Solhel and Selena. The palace is defended as long as necessary. Arriving at Gainto's palace, the party is greeted by Silas. He looks forward to meeting them, but first they must defeat his army. Yolkan takes command and tells the others to get to Rin. He and the spirits will hold off the monsters. They enter the palace. Ryan is willing to sacrifice himself to save Irene, so he uses the Sword of Kai's. The battle begins. Gainto's assistants attack the Dragon Knight. He himself attacks Caravan. Using mind control, the two find themselves in the Demon King's subconscious. There, Gaintho is ready to absorb the power and then the body of Carr. Nothing can stop him. But Ryan's plan works. The man pulls out Irene's sword. It is imbued with holy power. It prevents Ginto from approaching the king. The defense of the academy continues. There are so many monsters that the servants have no time to notice them. Kelrim tells Taisha that they must work harder. After years of quiet life, they turn into dragons. Their magic helps them fight the army more effectively. In his subconscious, Caravan uses his sword. Before that, he and Rukian put their own powers into it. When this sword is used, it blows up the room next to it. By throwing it, the explosion should hit Gainto. While the thief is unconscious, the king searches for another member of their team. He has little time to do so, but otherwise they will not be able to save Irene. It is the former king of the Eastern Demons, Suho Anjong. Carr tells him what happened after their last battle, how Hainto took his soul. Now the caravan needs his help. Suho doesn't want to help him out of hate. But this case doesn't concern her. Now it is necessary to save Irene. And if the Eastern King agrees, Carr promises to get him out of here. But during this time, Suho has lost his power, so to make things work, Caravan gives him his magic crystal. Now we can only hope for success. Outside, Ryan and Rega notice a sign. The dragon turns into a real one and attacks Gainto's helpers while the knight takes his position. Cassius asks Rukian to lead him to where Caravan and Irene are now. He has a job to do before he dies. Rin wakes up in her subconscious. There she sees Irene again, just as she did as a child. Irene tells her of the difficulties she has faced in this life. She is constantly reminded of Irene that this body and soul are not hers. She would give anything to end this torment. These thoughts prove to Irene that she is ready to face her destiny. She remembers that she is only herself. No one can take that away from her. Let her live her life as Irene. After this talk, Irene herself disappears. She has planned this for a long time, and once Gainto is defeated, Rin will never see her again. Outside, someone prevents Caravan from carrying out his plan. Silas distracts him, causing him to lose control of the crystal. They all gather into an entire statue. It causes a great explosion of energy. When Gainto contacts Irene, she's able to enter his subconscious. She doesn't feel bad about his defeat. He deserves it. 
Her words make Gaintho angry, so he doesn't hold back and attacks Irene. She signals Ryan to act. Without hesitation, the knight decapitates Gaintho. Now there was nothing to worry about. It was over for the three of them. Irene regains all her strength. After that, she will leave this world completely. The goddess offers Ryan to go with her. A new contract can be made where they will always be together. But Ryan has an unfulfilled promise to Irene, so he refuses. The knight could not abandon her. Finally, Irene embraces him and apologizes for all the pain she has caused him. They will never meet again. The plan works and they save Irene. When she regains consciousness, she sees Ryan's disappearing body. The princess is not ready to say goodbye to him. The caravan is being punished for using divine magic. But suddenly Cassius takes over. This was his last mission that Irene knew about. Her grandfather dies before Irene's eyes. He didn't deserve her love because he wanted to sacrifice it for his past life. For many years, a millennium or more, Cassius will wander through different worlds. But Rin will always await his return. The nightmare of the night ended just like that. The monsters turned to dust and vanished. Helga regained consciousness, and all the while she and Irene had a very long dream. It was decided to rebuild the academy at the expense of the dragons. After the academy was reopened and teaching resumed, the friends had a quiet dinner, but Rin wanted to tell a lie. She was not really human, but the daughter of the demon king. They think it's a good joke or a good idea for a Halloween costume. The girl has been planning to tell them for a long time, but she is unable to tell them the truth. After the battle, Irene spent most of her time alone. Ryan was in the hospital and Rega had vanished without a trace. She leaves a pie at the dragon's window, asking to meet and talk. Selena decides to open an academy for half-breeds in hell. After that night, many of them began to show themselves in society. As a gift, the academy is named after Irene. The girl tells her father about her feelings for Reich. He suggests she visit him. Taisha helps her with this. Nevia, Reich's mother, meets them at home. She tells them that the boy is not at home. She has some words she wants to say to Irene in person. She asks the girl to stop communicating with her son. From the beginning of their friendship, she knew that the princess felt nothing for him. But as time went on, they grew, and so did Rig's feelings. As a mother, she couldn't help but notice, but Irene looked at another boy. In order not to hurt her son, they should separate, too. When she returned to the academy, Ryan was waiting for her. Since Irene's mana is gone from the world, the guards must inform those waiting for her return. He will leave the academy. His contract with her is terminated. It is for her happiness. Ryan realized he was the reason she wasn't free, so he made this difficult decision. Irene returns to Rega's house and insists on meeting him. She realizes that she cannot exist without him. His father helps her get to Ray. He hears them and tries to run away, but Rin takes a chance. She falls on the dragon and enchants him with a kiss. This surprises Ray very much. Irene tells him how she felt after her boyfriend disappeared. It made her realize that she really loved him and didn't want to lose him. Without him, she would not be the Rin she is today. Rega didn't waste any time either. During his absence from the academy, he made a gift for the girl. Even though he sometimes behaved like a child, he hopes for a second chance. In honor of this, he gives Irene a ring made of his power. Caravan is about to hand over his throne as Demon King to Harjan. He no longer has the magic crystal that has weakened him. He's confident that he will be accepted because he has been with Carr all along. The Holy Spirit comes to him. He has noticed Cassius's grave in the backyard of the palace. Rukian is glad that despite all the bad things the evil spirit has done, they still consider him family. The father calls Irene and Rogue into his office. They are a little scared because they don't know why he did this. Once they are inside, Rega asks Kara for permission to marry her. He gives his consent. Suddenly, a woman's voice is heard behind them. Irene could not believe her eyes. Her mother was standing before her. Sane had returned to her family. Five years later, Irene and Rega were married. Everyone was very happy that day. The time of peace had come. Ryan spies on this celebration. All these years, he could not let go of Irene. The knight lived for her happiness. And the caravan is grateful. Now it is time for him to be free. Caden has been training with his grandfather. Seeing his success, Carr gives his sword to his grandson. For him, as the bearer of the Red Dragon's power, this gift means even greater power. They return home where the grandmother has prepared a meal. Their parents have not yet arrived. Caden looks out the window and sees Lena coming home. This behavior outrages him, so he goes downstairs to see her. The brother and sister begin to argue. Carr and Sane try to reconcile them, and then they wait for their parents to return. They return with their friends. The evening is spent in a cozy atmosphere, everyone talking and having fun. This is something Rin had only dreamed of before. Irene and Rega are grateful to each other for making this possible. They have always been there for each other in difficult times. 
and now they will be together for the rest of their lives. A new life for the couple has just begun.